So what we're looking at today is not the end of the story of Nehemiah, but in many ways it's the climax. And partly for that reason, partly because I think if I keep on going to the bitter end, I'm going to start repeating myself. This is going to be the last in the Nehemiah sermon series. However, in a couple of weeks' time, I can offer you a real special treat because Michael, some while back, recorded a message entitled The God We Invent. It's a good, thought-provoking message, and it's got some fantastic graphics that are way beyond my capabilities to produce. So we'll be showing Michael's uh, sermon in a couple of weeks' time. Then my current plan after that is to have a stab at exploring the big themes of Paul's letter to the Romans. Anyway, that's in the future. But today we're looking at Nehemiah chapter 8 and at Nehemiah's response to God's word. When the seventh month came and all the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the law had commanded for Israel. And so on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate, in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah and Messiah. And on his left were Pediah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbanana, uh, Zechariah and Mishal. I don't think it's hash banana in today, but who cares? Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Barney, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shebathai, oh, I hate Jer this book, don't you? Um, Hadiah, Masaiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jezebel, Hanan, and Paliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. And then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. And send some of those who have nothing, some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Don't grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Don't grieve. And then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, from palms and shade trees to make temporary shelters, as it is written. And so the people went out and they brought back branches and they built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. And the whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. 
from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the Lord of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. So just to bring us up to speed, the wall around Jerusalem has been built. We're told that the first phase was actually accomplished in 52 days, although presumably there was still plenty to do to shore it up and tidy it up after that. People settled back into their towns and folks have contributed to the renewed worship in the temple. But there is one big thing that's missing. It's actually years and years since anyone opened up the law of God and explained it. And now through Ezra the priest, the other great God-given leader at this time, that's put right. On the big day, everyone's assembled in the square by the water gate. They arrive at the crack of dawn from all the surrounding towns and villages. Men, women, children, everyone who's got any sort of capacity to understand. And there at the front on a great big platform is Ezra booming out the words of God's law at the top of his voice. Scattered around the square are a baker's dozen of Levites not just reading the words of the law, but explaining them to the people around them. And so this great crowd are standing there for hour after hour, from dawn till noon, maybe six hours at a stretch, listening to, grappling with the law of God that's being read to them. They're doing something that is absolutely fundamental to being part of the people of God. They're engaging with what God has to say to them through his word. And it seems to me that in doing that, they got five very important things right and one rather important thing wrong. In the first place, they recognise God's word for what it is. I mean, frankly, you don't spend six hours uh, standing under a hot sun on the basis of Ezra saying, well, guys, I've had a few thoughts about how we might all live our lives a little bit better. Would you like me to share them uh, with you? I mean, who's interested in what Ezra thinks? Or, or, or Eddie Latimer, for that matter. Or, or Eric Seeger, or, or David Morell. Probably him least of all, actually. I mean, we're just one voice, one opinion among many. In the church that I was brought up, people used to say, I like to think. I like to think that sin doesn't really matter too much. I like to think that everyone will get to heaven in the end. I like to think that Jesus didn't really mean what he said on that occasion. I like to think. Well, of course, as a guide to truth, there are few things less reliable than what you or I would personally like to believe. We'd all like to believe that the coronavirus will suddenly disappear tomorrow in a puff of smoke. We would all like to believe that all the debts the UK has been racking up during the lockdown will be instantly repaid by a gigantic big check falling out of the sky. We know it won't happen like that. What we think doesn't really count for so much, but what if? What if the creator and the sovereign of the universe has things to say to us? Well, that's an entirely different matter. If he's got things to say to us, it's going to be worth listening. When Paul writes to his friends in a place called Thessalonica, he says, when you receive the word of God, I thank God that you, you received it as it truly is, not as just a human opinion, but as God's word, which is at work in you. That is the first and the most important thing to do with God's word, to recognise it for what it truly is. Second thing they did right was that they took the time and trouble to hear it properly. Now, I'm not sure how many of us would actually manage six hours on the stretch, but they did. And we're told that throughout that time, they listened intently. It's important that they did, because, of course, right through Bible times, folks would have had little or no chance to read the scriptures privately at home. Now, it's not because they were illiterate, incidentally. Most of them could probably read. But it's because actually only the very rich would be able to afford the scrolls on which the scriptures were written. People didn't read privately. 
And so with no private Bible reading, let alone Bible notes to explain the scriptures, the only way that they were going to engage with God's word was to hear it read in public. And that actually goes for New Testament times just as much as old. All of which means that actually you and I have got very little excuse for not following their example and taking the time and the trouble to engage with the scripture. Because frankly, it's an awful lot easier for us to access God's word than it ever was for them. Third thing that they did right was they approached God's word practically. Sometimes people approach the Bible simply out of curiosity to get information. How old was Methuselah? How high was the Tower of Babel? And all that sort of rubbish. My first theological degree was at King's College London, where the study of the Bible was done almost entirely as an intellectual exercise. I remember one seminar which was based on Acts chapter 2. And you might think that it would be impossible to study the day of Pentecost without being inspired by it. Well, these guys managed it. We spent an hour and a half in an entirely theoretical discussion of one single phrase. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they came to the Bible with all the personal commitment you might bring to the Times crossword puzzle. But of course, the purpose of God's word is not information, but it's formation. In the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus tells his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. When Paul talks about the scriptures in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, all scripture is God breathed. In other words, it's breathed out by God. It's, it's the words that he wants to say to us. But Paul isn't concerned uh, just with theology here. What he's concerned with is uh, more about how we should uh, receive the word of God and what it's actually for. And here's the full quotation. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's not a theological textbook. It is not an encyclopedia of religion. It is a training manual for life. And so when we come to scripture, we should have the same questions that Ezra's hearers had in Nehemiah chapter 8. What does this say about me? What does it say about God's purpose for my life? What, what does it tell me about what God expects of me? What does it tell me about what God wants to do in my life? How should I live on the basis of what I'm hearing and what I'm reading? They approached the word of God practically. Great thing to do. The fourth thing that folks in our reading got right is... They were prepared to be surprised by God's word. As they listened, there was at least one thing that took them by surprise. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. Well, they hadn't been doing this. In fact, they hadn't even been aware of it. In fact, it is clear that this Feast of Tabernacles had not been celebrated for donkey's years because verse 17 says the Israelites hadn't celebrated it like this since the day of Joshua the son of Nun. Came as a bolt out of the blue and God's people gladly took it on board. They allowed themselves to be surprised by God's word. It seems to me very often we lose our capacity to be surprised by God's word because we, we know what it's going to say, don't we? Or at least we know what we think it ought to be saying before we actually read it. And so we, we read the Bible through a lens that only allows us to see what we're expecting to see. You can do that by looking at uh, scripture through the lens of our culture in the 19th century all sorts of individuals felt that Jesus probably wasn't quite the way that the Gospels describe him. So they wrote their own versions of the life of Jesus. And surprise, surprise, it turned out that Jesus was a progressive 19th century gentleman just like them. 
Albert Schweitzer compared them to a guy looking down into a well and seeing nothing more than their own reflection staring back up at them. Leslie Newbigin describes the liberal theologians as operating on the principle that the scriptures provide the words, but we provide the meaning. If we look at the Bible through the lens of our own culture, we're never going to be surprised because we are never going to be open to God saying what we don't already think. And actually, orthodox, supposedly Bible-believing Christians can do the same. I, I'm, I'm immensely proud of the fact that 200 years ago, Christians led the charge against the vile slave trade, both here and, and in the West Indies, and, and Baptists were involved in that. But I'm deeply troubled by the fact that many other Christians seem to find nothing in their Bibles to challenge the awful cruelties that we inflicted on innocent Africans. They found nothing there. In South Africa, some of the staunchest supporters of apartheid came, came from the Dutch Reformed Church. What was in their Bibles, I wonder? In the US, it seems there are plenty of evangelical Christians who read their Bibles and still think that it's important for everyone to walk around with guns and for America to dominate the rest of the world. We probably don't spot it so readily in ourselves, but you know, I'm convinced that we do this, that we come to the Bible where our theology, whether it be evangelical or reformed or charismatic, and because we think we know what the Bible should say, that's what we find, whether it actually is there in the text or not. When I was little, I went to a Sunday school where we had story after story about gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who never made ways, who was always kind to everybody. And so when as a teenager I became a Christian, for a long time I really wasn't interested in reading the Gospels. I didn't want to know because I, I knew all about Jesus as a man and frankly he was pastel shaded and boring. He was a vanilla saviour. And, and, and it was, I, I read that into any gospel story that I ended up hearing, this is Jesus. It was only when I read the gospels cover to cover in J.B. Phillips' translation that I realised that the Jesus I thought I knew all about was actually completely different from my ideas of him. He was stronger. He moved through the gospel story with authority and power. He confronted injustice. He stood up to bullies. He made outrageous claims. And when I allowed myself to be surprised by scripture, what I found was a whole lot richer than I ever imagined. When we come to scripture, we need to be ready to see what we do not expect to see not to brush it off, brush off its challenges and surprises by automatically saying things like, well, it probably doesn't actually mean that, or, well, that's not what I've been taught. Probably we should pray as we come to the Bible, Lord, enable me to come to this with fresh eyes, with a, with a fresh heart that's open to your Holy Spirit. Enable me to see not myself, not my own ideas, not the traditions of my church reflected there. Help me to see you as you really are. Fifth, they were prepared to be changed by what they heard. Hearts were changed. The word of God clearly got to them, got under their defences. There was a real concern in their acknowledgement. Gosh, this is what God says and we're not even doing it. Worship was changed. There were three festivals that every Israelite, every Jew was expected to take part in. There was the Passover, otherwise known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which reenacted the exodus out of Egypt. There was the Feast of Weeks that became known later as Pentecost, which was basically a kind of harvest festival. And then there was the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles came at the end of the farming year when the grain had been turned into flour and the wine had been made from the grapes. And it had a kind of dual reference because it was linked naturally enough with God's provision in harvest, but it was also linked to Israel's redemption from Egypt. And for that reason, people would come together in makeshift camps in a kind of great big jamboree that reflected how God's people had lived in tents 
and shelters through their exodus journey through the wilderness. So it was actually a great feast for the people of Nehemiah's time because it reminded them of how God had provided for them and also of how he had rescued them from Babylon and brought them back home. But it had fallen into disuse. Folks had forgotten all about it. And now they're reminded of it in the law that Ezra has read out to them all. They joyfully enter into this celebration of God's saving goodness in a way that they hadn't done since the time of Joshua. The worship of God's people was changed by what they heard in the word of God. And their lifestyle was changed. Not, I think, all at once. In chapter 13, at the end of Nehemiah, it's clear that some of the people had lapsed back into their old sinful ways, but Ezra's teaching of God's law nonetheless marks a new beginning in God's people beginning to base their lives on what God has said to them um, and, 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 and actually living it out through what Moses had said all those years before. Now those same three things are an indication that God's word is doing its work in us too. When our hearts are touched and changed, when our worship is deepened and our delight in the Lord is renewed. And above all, when our lifestyle is turned around and brought into line with what God wants. All these things, the people listening to Ezra in that crowded square got absolutely right, but one thing they got wrong. And that is they allowed themselves to get demoralized and condemned by what they heard. It's been said that a good sermon comforts the afflicted, but it afflicts the comfortable. Well, that crowd in the Watergate Square are well and truly afflicted. They're in tears. They're distraught because the word of God has just shown how far they've fallen from what God asks from them. And so in verse 9 and 10, Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra the, and the Levites have to go to the people and say, it's, this day is holy to the Lord your God, don't mourn and weep. Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. This day is holy to our Lord, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now there's something about their response that's right because it shows that they haven't tried to evade the force of what God's saying to them but there's also something wrong about it. Because the purposes of scripture are not to flatten us but to build us up. Scripture convicts us of our sin but it does not condemn us and there's a difference. If you've got a music tutor or a sports coach They'll spend a fair bit of time telling you where you're wrong. They'll correct you and they'll keep on correcting you until you get it right. They may also, like my violin teacher did, uh, show you what the music ought to sound like or how the sports thing ought to be done. And that's bound to show you that there's a great big gulf between the way that you should be playing and the way that you actually are playing. You can respond in one of two ways to that. First of all, you can conclude I'm a total failure. Try to learn a musical instrument or play a sport, absolutely hopeless. And then the chances are that you'll stop really trying. It's a lost cause. Or, secondly, you can conclude, well, I'm a long way from where I need to be, but I'm getting there, however slowly. And my teacher's correction is an indication that they believe in me, that they know that one day I can be better. Well, that crowd in Nehemiah 8 responded to God's word in the first of those two ways, but the second way is actually the appropriate one. The joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, we can rejoice in the fact that God's at work in us, that he's brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into his wonderful light. He's caused us to know his love and to experience his Holy Spirit. In the case of the people of Nehemiah's time, they could know that God had brought them home, that he had enabled the temple to be built and, and the wall around their city to be renewed and now God is speaking into their lives. He's on their case and all of that should have been a cause for confidence and, and encouragement, not despair. See, we are each of us a work in progress. We are not yet the way God wants us to be or created us to be, but one day we will be. Our lives may look more like a building site right now with all of the mess and the rubbish that goes with building sites, but God is making us into a building 
but he is designed to be magnificent. He who began a good work in us will complete it to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should go through life with a keen awareness of our sin, definitely not guilt-ridden. We should go through our lives knowing that there's much in us that still needs to change, but taking courage to the fact that God has already accepted us. And I this very moment is at work in our lives. We can go through our lives taking confidence from the fact that God operates in the mastermind principle. I've started, so I'll finish. And he will. As the hymn has it, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before him, lost in wonder, love and praise. I wonder, can we pray just for a moment. And Father, I'm so grateful that one of the marks of your love for us, one of the indications of your respect for us, is that you choose to communicate with us, that you share with us your word, your truth, your purposes, you open your heart to us. Would you help us to come to your word with an eagerness, with an openness of mind and heart? Would you help us to come in such a way that your word, in the power of your spirit, will truly change us into the likeness of Jesus. Amen. And God bless you. Have a fantastic couple of weeks before we meet again.